Good afternoon, everyone. It's been over a year since I've added an episode to the series, Mary Unveils the Apocalypse. It's still on my list to add conferences on the seven trumpets and the two cities. I want to speak of the book of Daniel now because Mary unveils and unlocks the meaning of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, and this prophecy supplements the apocalypse by giving us a specific time frame for end time events. I've been hesitant about going forward in uploading more conferences to this series because to be true to the biblical texts, one must speak openly of the Antichrist. I learned the year of the Antichrist when I was still in Carmel. I was praying in the oratory. I'm not sure what book I had in my, mo in my hand, but many passages of scripture and Mary's messages rapidly converged on the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter nine. It was like that moment when I suddenly saw the book of Revelation. It was like that moment when I suddenly saw the book of Revelation as a set of seven sevens. Once you see it, you can't stop seeing it because it's so clear. After my call to leave Carmel, I began giving talks on the apocalypse, but I refrained from declaring how soon the Antichrist would become manifest. The topic causes panic. The majority of Christians of all denominations associate the Antichrist with the end of the world. Catholics should know better because the Blessed Mother has been explaining the end time scripture passages since her apparitions to St. Catherine Labore beginning in 1830. But if Catholics ignore Mary's private revelations and rely on saintly scholars and the speculations of several church fathers, they need to understand that none of those commentaries or speculations are church dogma. The Lord allowed holy men to conflate the reign of Antichrist with the end of the world because it wasn't crucial for them to know the details. They weren't destined to live through that era. And how could they describe or imagine the technological age that was coming? It is we who are destined to live through it. And the mother of God has been appearing in our era because she wants us to understand and be prepared. In her apparitions, Our Lady tries to impress on us that we are living in the worst era of all of history, past, present, and future. It's never been and never will be again this sinful. The proliferation of sin has released an unprecedented amount of demonic activity. Mary explains that we are living in the end of times, plural, or the latter times. But she is definitely not talking about the final time, the end time, the end of the world. She uses the plural times because we are transitioning from the close of one era, which has been heavily dominated by evil spirits, into a long and beautiful era where all things will feel new because the world will have a new outlook of respect for the Creator and His commandments. This era has various names, such as the era of peace, through the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, or the era of Christ the King, because Jesus will reign from the Eucharistic throne of his tabernacles throughout the earth. In Marian apparitions, we learn that the Antichrist's appearance will occur at the end of one era when demonic activity is dominant and reaches its peak, and then the Antichrist will be defeated and will transition into the next era when Christ will be dominant. Mary says that we are in that demonic era now and can expect the manifestation of the Antichrist very soon. Mary affirms that he is an individual person, but it's also correct to speak of an Antichrist era or milieu because it is anti-Christian. And here I am, I've the other reason I've delayed with this with giving this conference is because I don't have a studio where I'm in, and so far all of my conferences have just been audio, and then I add pictures to the YouTube. But for this one, I wanted my face to be on the camera as someone not talking behind the screen. I'm standing behind this as something I truly believe in, and I'm not ashamed to say it, and I want it to be associated with myself and the order of the Mother of God. So I'll continue now. Oh, so here I am in Mejigori, of all places. This is where Mary provided a videographer and the opportunity to speak to a group of, of um, her pilgrims that are here. And uh, so it's pretty amazing that at this time and in this place, I'm able to record this, this conference. 
it is complex. Um, I've, as we go through it, I'll be going through verse by verse of scripture, and it's a little hard to follow. Um, I will put the transcript on the YouTube um, description page and, and my website, so you can find it and read on it and uh, meditate on it. And no one has verified this. I haven't shared this with spiritual directors or priests. No one has vetted this. And so it's, it's purely mine, um, as I see what Mary has been saying to us and what the scripture has said. And so I will be very open to any kind of correction or other interpretations if you want to share it with me. I'm not saying that I have the definitive um, interpretation of this passage. I'm only saying this is what I see and I feel I have to talk about it because Mary is talking about it. Oh, and I also read from this transcript more than look at the camera. I never talk off the cuff because, for one thing, my memory is not that great. And also, I tend to get off on tangents and take you all over the place. So to stick to a particular tangent in a coherent way, I tend to read my texts and prepare them ahead of time. All right. Um, so this era or milieu can be called anti-Christian. Now, are the three and a half years to be taken literally or symbolically? The prophet Daniel will give us specifics. The book of Daniel is all about, about world dynasties. The first half of the book is in the context of the historical ancient kingdom of Babylon. The Jews are living in a time when Babylon is dominant. Daniel and his companions try to bear witness to the one true God. In chapter 2, Yahweh grants the first king of Babylon the famous dream of the statue or idol with the head of gold and the feet of clay. The king sees the great statue destroyed and replaced by a single stone that becomes a mountain. The king's wise men can't interpret it because the king won't even tell them what he dreamed. Only Daniel is able to describe the dream and then interpret it for the king. Daniel's interpretation concludes... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. It shall be break in pieces all of these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. The book will continue with seemingly random incidents from the lives of King Nebuchadnezzar and his successors because these early chapters are setting the stage for the second half of the book which passes from the nighttime dreams of pagan kings to profound end-time visions granted to the wise and pious Daniel. These latter chapters are almost dizzying in symbolic or apocalyptic language. Here we find many overlappings with the last book of the Bible. Only in Daniel and the book of Revelation do we encounter the expression a time, two times, and a half time, that is the famous 42 months, with two calculations, 1290 days or 1335 days. Whereas the pagan kings were merely bewildered by their dreams of historical events, Daniel is sickened, depressed, and absolutely appalled at the profound level of evil which he beholds in his visions of the end times. The books of Daniel and Revelation develops the same theme of a time that will be unsurpassed in distress a time of an enormous spiritual struggle between the kingdom whose capital is the bridal city of Jerusalem and the kingdom whose capital is the harlot city of Babylon. Whereas the book of Revelation was written after Jesus' birth, death and resurrection, and is concerned with spiritual resistance to Christ, the book of Daniel is longer in scope because it prophesies the historical coming of Christ with amazing accuracy. What I saw in the cloister oratory a decade ago was that Mary shows us that the same Daniel chapter 9 timeline also predicts the appearance of the Antichrist. The Venerable Servant of God, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, gave a famous sermon entitled, The Only Person Ever Pre-Announced. Here is a short excerpt. Quote, History is full of men who have claimed that they have come from God, or that they were gods, or that they bore messages from God. There's Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius, Christ, Lao Tzu, and thousands of others, right down to the person who founded a new religion this very day. Each of them has a right to be heard and considered, but as a yardstick, external to and outside of whatever is to be measured is needed, 
So there must be some permanent tests available to all men, all civilizations, and all ages, by which they can decide whether any one of these claimants, or all of them, are justified in their claims. These tests are of two kinds, reason and history. Reason, because everyone has it, even those without faith, and history, because if any one of these men actually came from God, the least thing that God could do to support his claim would be to pre-announce his coming." End quote. Archbishop Sheen goes on to explain how the Christ was the only person pre-announced. Prophecies spanning more than a thousand years were so accurate that expectation was extremely high at the time of Jesus' birth, not only among Jews, but even by astrologers east of Israel, who showed up at court with gifts for the new king. Herod's slaughter of infant boys at Bethlehem made headlines, and many Jews surmised that the young Messiah had escaped and was living somewhere in obscurity. Thousands of self-respecting men, including Herod's successor, paid close heed to the private revelations of a young Levite who didn't work a single miracle, but fasted on locusts, wore scratchy camel's hair. John the Baptist, who pre-announced that the Messiah was already walking among them and would manifest any day. Jews took this seriously because it corresponded to what the scriptures already indicated about the time and the place. But Bishop Sheen doesn't mention that one other person who has been pre-announced. The Gospels relate that Jesus, toward the end of his life, warned the apostles to be on guard in the future because men would appear claiming to be Christ. Jesus didn't want his followers to be deceived or taken by surprise. The Apostle St. John refers several times to these false Christs as antichrists. St. Peter warned about false teachers who would bring in destructive heresies. St. Paul refers to an oral tradition which might have come from Jesus, but which the evangelists hesitated to write down. St. Paul writes the Thessalonians not to be anxious about any imminent coming of one particular deceiver, the great deceiver, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who will oppose and exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That was from 1 Corinthians. The, apost the apocalypse will use veiled language to say a great deal about this particular false prophet. If the true Christ was expected and identified because he had been pre-announced in prophecies that gave an accurate historical context, I shouldn't have been surprised that day in Carmel when I discovered that the prophet Daniel provided accurate historical context to help us know when to expect and how to identify the Antichrist. Daniel, a captive in Babylon, was pondering the 70 years prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, quoting Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Thus says Yahweh, this whole land will become a ruin and a waste, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then, after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, making that land an everlasting waste. Why 70 years? The answer is given in 2 Chronicles, um, to Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21. The Israelites kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, till the wrath of Yahweh rose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons, until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, quote, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years, end quote. Each day of captivity represented a week when the Sabbath day had not been kept holy. Seventy weeks of missed Sabbath days tells us that Israel had not been keeping the Lord's day holy for 490 years, a very sad testimony. In verse 1 of chapter 9, we are told that it, now, it is now the reign of King Darius the Mede. The kings of Babylon had perished, overcome by the Medes and Persians, Daniel is pondering the number of years. 
With prayer and fasting, he beseeches God to understand this prophecy. Daniel, what's to understand? The Jews should just count forward from the fall of the temple, and when they reach 70 years, they could expect that the captivity would end and they could return to Israel. My theory is that Daniel persisted in fasting and begging God's forgiveness for the people because he was fearful that the exile would be prolonged if God did not see sufficient repentance. Suddenly, the archangel Gabriel appeared to explain that God had a greater plan than the return of the Jews to the Promised Land. Gabriel proceeded to deliver to Daniel the famous 70 weeks prophecy, which became the foundational text for future generations of Israelites. Thenceforth, the Jews would look forward with confidence to the coming of a great anointed one, a Messiah who would be king of kings. Gabriel gave signs about how this Christ would be recognized and how many years Israel would have to wait. Let's read the text. The English translations are in close agreement. Um, it's chapter 9 of Daniel. There's four verses. They're quite long. Verses 24 to 27. Seventy weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy, literally a holy of holies, it could be a place or person. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, that is the 70th week, and for half of that week, in Hebrew it could be in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. And upon the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator." End quote. I will proceed now by applying the passage, phrase by phrase, first to Christ and the old Jerusalem, and then to the Antichrist and the new Jerusalem. Verse 24. We'll break it down in phrases, but we'll just do Christ first, and we won't spend much time on Christ because we've, we've seen that. So the verse 24 is, 70 weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city. 70 weeks of years. The Jerusalem temple was destroyed by the king of Babylon about the year 587 BC. 490 years calculated will be 1077 BC. That was the year Saul was born, about the year Saul was born, when Samuel was judge of Israel. At the end of Samuel's life, the Israelites wanted a king to lead them into battle. Quote, and, and continuing this verse, these years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. What is that? That began with original sin. To put an end to sin by forgiveness through the authority of the Son of God and to atone for iniquity through Christ's death on the cross, to bring in everlasting righteousness by opening the gates of heaven to those who wish to share in Christ's re resurrection, to seal both vision and prophet, because Christ will fulfill the law and what the prophet said about him, and to anoint a most holy by, giving, by Christ giving authority to Peter, Matthew 16, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So now we'll go over those phrases again, and we'll talk about how they could apply to the Antichrist. So this section, verse 24, begins, 70 weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and your holy city. 
how do we calculate these 70 weeks of years? In the first, we calculated backward from the king of Babylon and saw that they had not kept the Sabbath since the time of Samuel. Here we look 49, 490 years calculated backward now takes us to the beginning of the 1500s, which marks the revolt of Father Martin Luther, an Augustinian priest against the one holy Catholic apostolic church. A former Pentecostal Protestant provides a good summary of the significance of Luther's act. Quoting Mary Beth Kremsky in Surprised by Truth, I examined the roots of Protestantism, the Reformation. I thought it would make the most sense to look at the main root, Martin Luther. No matter what their present status, all Protestant groups owe their existence ultimately to him and are still influenced by his beliefs. Wanting the undiluted truth about the Reformation, I decided to examine actual documents from the times rather than rely on someone else's commentary. Contrary to what I had been told, she had been a Protestant, Luther did not lead a loyal reform. He took aim not simply at certain abuses or bad leaders within the church, but at the church herself. He opposed the church's assertion held from the beginning that she was endowed by Christ with the authority to teach and to shepherd the people of God in his name. Luther used the concept of spiritual equality to justify his stand against church leadership. He used the teaching of the priesthood of all believers to claim that the Pope and the bishops had no right, no special gift or power to lead and teach the Christian people. In his own words, quote, any creature that has crawled from its baptism can boast that he is already ordained to be priest, bishop, or pope. All Christians really belong to the spiritual estate and there is no distinction between them. End quote. I ask, no distinction? Something's wrong here. Wasn't it Jesus himself who made a distinction by naming as apostles only 12 of his disciples? Didn't scripture plainly teach that although all believers have the same spirit, they don't all have the same gifts, and they don't all have equal authority? So that was Mary Beth's journey from Protestantism until finally she became Catholic. Going on to in this verse, quote, the 70 years, 70 weeks are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. Martin Luther was responding to a true spiritual crisis. Sin was rampant throughout the body of Christ. On Halloween of 1517, when Luther nailed his treatise of grievances to the church door, it was the official beginning of a great transgression and apostasy of Catholics. The moral decay of the church's mother city would be dramatically expressed just a few years later in the sack of Rome in 1527 by the troops, by the troops of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. This would be followed by bloody wars between Christians. Pope Clement VII, writing to Emperor Charles V, described the city of Rome as a corpse in shreds. The earlier schism with the Orthodox, some centuries early, earlier, involved a difficulty with the authority of Peter, but it was not a rejection of authority. The priesthood, the mass, the Eucharist, and the sacraments re remained intact for the Orthodox, but the Protestant revolt was a definitive rejection of Christ's presence in his body and blood in the body of Christ. This transgression has not been resolved. The unity of Christendom has not been restored. The breach has not been finished and repaired. Next, to put an end to sin. Sin began in the, garden of, in the Garden of Eden when the serpent provoked Adam and Eve to rebellion. The expulsion of demons from the earth would, end in, would, would put an end to an unceasing provocation. The apocalypse suggests that this will happen. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Next, and to atone for iniquity through the suffering of Christ's body of co-workers, united under the headship of the first co-worker, Mary, co-redemptrix, who did not lose faith and run away, but stood firm beneath the cross. In the vision of the third secret of Fatima, the angels gather the blood of martyrs and sprinkle the people with their blood. Next, to bring in everlasting righteousness, that is, by the baptism of many nations, 
quoting Revelations, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. Isaiah, There shall be no hurt on all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Next, to seal both vision and prophet, because scripture and many apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary will be proved true, and to anoint a most holy by the recognition of the authority of a new successor of Peter after a period of tribulation and confusion. Now we move on to verse 25, first applying it to Christ, the son of Mary. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This announcement refers to the definitive order of King Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem as recorded in the book of Ezra chapter 7, which was given in the year 458 BC. Previously, two pagan kings, Cyrus in 538 BC and Darius in 520 BC, had called for the rebuilding of the temple, but progress was unsteady because the people were unprotected. The temple was sufficiently completed by 515 BC, at least for occasional ritual sacrifice to be reestablished, but the city of Jerusalem was still in ruins. After, no, excuse me, and then the next line, the coming of an anointed, a prince. After the definitive order from King Artaxerxes, Ezra arrived, a zealous anointed, a Levitical priest who was accompanied by 5,000 Jewish recruits from Babylon. This event marked a fresh beginning. Quoting Smith's Bible Dictionary from 1868, Ezra was a priest descended from Hilkiah the high priest and he was empowered to appoint magistrates and judges in Judea with power of life and death over all offenders. This ample commission from the king was granted him at his own request, and it appears that his great design was to effect a religious reformation among the Palestinian Jews and to bring them back to the observation of the law of Moses, from which they had grievously declined. Ezra's autobiography ends abruptly, and we hear nothing more of him till 13 years afterward, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, we find him again at Jerusalem with Nehemiah. The next line, there shall be seven weeks. Nehemiah, the new governor of Jerusalem, arrived from Babylon about 445 B.C., Scripture testifies that this was the man responsible for the rebuilding of the city, adding 49 years, seven weeks of years, from 458 B.C., the year of Artaxerxes' decree, we are now at 409 B.C., the year that Nehemiah's term of office is known to have concluded. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. 62 weeks encompasses 434 years. At the end of Nehemiah's governorship, the situation at Jerusalem quickly decayed. Chaos will reign in the coming four centuries as the Greeks and other nations make incursions on the land of Israel and the faith of the people. It will be a long struggle in a troubled time. The temple will be profaned and reconstructed yet again. Verse 25. Now we'll take those lines and apply them to the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This announcement refers to the definitive order of the Queen of Heaven. She appeared in Mexico at the center of the New World. At dawn on Saturday, December 9, 1531, Saint Juan Diego was on his way from the hill of Topatlac near Quetelon. A beautiful young woman appeared before a cloud and spoke to him. On Tuesday morning, December 12th, she told Juan Diego to climb up the hill, saying that he would find flowers blooming. Quote, this is the sign that you must take to the Lord Bishop. In my name, tell him that with this he will see and recognize my will and that he must do what I ask. And the Mother Mary continued, I ardently desire that a teokali, a temple, be built here for me, where I can show and offer all my love, 
compassion, my help, and my protection, for I am your merciful mother. Here I wish to hear and help you, and all who dwell in this land, and all those others who love me, and invoke and place their confidence in me, and to hear your complaints and remedy all your sorrows, hardships, and sufferings. And in order to carry out what my mercy seeks, you must go to the bishop's palace in Mexico and tell him that I sent you to make it clear how very much I desire that he build a teocalli, a temple, for me here on this place. You shall tell him exactly all you have seen and marveled at and what you have heard. I use that Aztec word because they say it means temple, not just a church or a place of worship. St. Paul taught that there were two Jerusalems. There was the earthly city, which represented those who followed the covenant of Moses, and there was the city above, the mother city, with rep which represents those who partake of the new and eternal covenant. He said in Galatians 4, Now Hagar is Mount Zion in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem of his day, for she is in slavery with her children. But the new Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. The Catholics of the New World proceeded to erect an impressive temple, and they also obeyed the heart of the command, a spiritual edifice, a temple of living stones. Mary's miraculous image imprinted on Juan Diego's tilma and her kind words during four days of apparitions won the hearts of the people of Mexico. Just at the time when eight million European Christians broke off from Rome, nine million Indians sought baptism. This is a quote from uh, the historian, Dr. Charles Carroll, I think it's Charles. Uh, the Holy Friar Martin of Valencia, head of the Franciscan party of 12 missionaries who left Spain to begin the evangelization in Mexico in earnest, wrote to King Charles V in November 1532, less than a year after the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and just five years after Charles' troops had sacked Rome, to report to him that 200,000 Indians have been baptized. Indians approached them for baptism, and when they arrived in the villages, these, these, these missionaries, for the first time, before their preaching had even begun, the flood of baptisms continued during all the remaining years of the life of St. Juan Diego and Bishop Zumarraga. The two died within a few days of each other in the spring of 1548. By then, the total number of baptized Indians in Mexico was approximately nine million. Quoting Ephesians, So then, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the land in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, Ephesians 2. So the next section in this verse 25, the coming of an anointed one, a prince. Luther's act in 1517 of nailing this thesis to the church door breached the gates of the temple, which would fracture Christians into thousands of denominations. In 1531, the Blessed Virgin sent out a call for rebuilding but where is a prince who will oversee the operation for the whole church? In the century preceding Luther, almost every pope had been keenly aware of the need for reform. There had even been the ecumenical council of the Lateran from 1512 to 1517 under Pope Julius II and Leo X, but the council was disorganized and half-hearted. In 1520, this is three years after Luther, Pope Leo X condemned 41 propositions from the writings of Martin Luther, but many bishops felt that the final decision on controversies concerning the faith required another ecumenical council. On October 13, 1534, Pope Paul III was elected and he made remote preparations for a council, but he and his two successors couldn't manage to reform themselves, let alone all of Christendom. The Council of Trent finally opened in 1545, but frequent political disruptions delayed the completion of its many sessions until 1563. Who would be the new Ezra to implement the reform? Quoting um, the famous French scholar Henri Daniel Rau, Pope Nicholas V, declaring himself about to correct the vices of the clergy, 
Pius II, terrified by the scourges threatening Christianity, drew up a huge schema of reform which began with Rome and the Curia. Paul II, fulminating, fulminating against simony and the laxity of religious houses. Sixtus IV, proclaiming that monks should labor to sow the good grain of wisdom and uprightness in the souls of men. And even the despicable Alexander VI himself, for a few fleeting months, summoned a commission of reform and directing it with noble ardor to prepare the cleansing bull flatus vocis. None of these splendid projects got beyond the stage of design or fine words, or at the very most, a tentative beginnings." End quote. It was a holy and zealous priest who was anointed prince on January 7, 1566. Pope St. Pius V began his pontificate with energy. By wearing his Dominican habit, he introduced the custom for popes to wear simple white garments and to adopt monastic customs concerning frugality in the papal household. St. Pius suppressed corrupt religious orders. He demanded that bishops reside in their dioceses. He published a catechism for parish priests, and he advanced uniform recitation of the mass to assure that it was celebrated with dignity. And he introduced all these and more reforms in such a gracious, Christ-like manner that he won respect and enthusiastic obedience. The next, and there shall be seven weeks. Now in the year 1531, Mary sent forth a call at Guadalupe to rebuild the church. Plus seven weeks, 49 years, would come to 1581. In the year 1534, we saw that Pope Paul III issued a call for the reforming Council of Trent. So 49 years from that leads us to 1583. So we're in the early 1580s between the two. These Marian and papal proclamations converged precisely between two pontificates of men who could be called the new Ezra and Nehemiah. St. Pius V was the first reforming pontiff from 1566 to 1572, followed by Gregory XIII, a second reforming pontiff who reigned until 1585. A primary goal of St. Pius V's pontificate was to form a holy league of Christian powers in a crusade against the Ottoman Turks who were, who were invading Europe. Quoting a handbook on Guadalupe, Don Fray Alonso de Montefort, second Archbishop of Mexico, became a most enthusiastic champion of Our Lady of Guadalupe as he witnessed the continual flow of miracles wrought through her intercession. Being very alert to the impending crisis in Europe, he had a small reproduction of the sacred image of Guadalupe made in oils and touched to the original tilma. He sent it as a present to King Philip II of Spain in the year 1570. Montefiore expressed the hope that when the struggle with the Mohammedans arrived, the king would place the copy of the sacred image of Guadalupe in a suitable location in the Christian navy being confident that she would work a miracle for the Holy League, as she had done so many times for the Mexicans. King Philip complied and had it mounted in the cabin of Admiral, Admiral Andrea Doria in anticipation of the Battle of Lepanto." End quote. Forces were joined in the great naval battle in the Gulf of Lepanto in the Sea of Corinth on October 7, 1571. It was the largest naval battle in Western history since classical antiquity, involving more than 400 warships. In Thanksgiving, St. Pius V instituted the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, which was changed by his successor, Gregory XIII, to the Feast of Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary. Next. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. 62 weeks comprises, encompasses 434 years. At the end of the reign of Pope Pius V, the situation in the New Jerusalem quickly decayed. Christendom will remain fractured by Protestantism and schism with the Eastern churches in the coming four centuries. Sincere efforts to restore Christian unity will be undertaken and knocked down again and again. Now I'm quoting again from Henri Daniel Rowe. Quote, the manifold policies of Pope St. Pius V were by no means fruitful of lasting results, and immediately after his death, religious passions once again broke loose, more violent and fused than heretofore. 
Pius V was a very great pope, and his enduring title to posterity's gratitude and admiration is summarized by Cardinal Grint in these words, quote, the decisions of the Council of Trent would become reality. The ardent labors of Catholicism would receive fresh impetus, end quote. Nevertheless, it has to be admitted that so enormous a task could scarcely have been fulfilled in a pontificate of only six years had there not existed at the same time a galaxy of saints who would strive with all their might to reanimate, reorganize, and invigorate the Catholic Church with St. Charles Borromeo, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Philip Neri, and others." End quote. Keeping in mind that this second fulfillment of the prophecy concerns the restoration and renewal of the church, not a physical building, the use of, quote, squares and moat can be interpreted figuratively. The squares would represent the use of reason to explain the faith clearly in catechisms and decrees, while the moat represents defensive measures to protect Catholics from zealous heretics who might try to invade the stronghold. Now we begin verse 26, and we'll apply it first to Christ, the son of Mary. And after the 62 weeks, going back to Christ, from 458 BC, the year of Artaxerxes' decree, plus seven weeks, 49 years, plus 434 years of the 62 weeks, brings us to about the year AD 24. Note, there is no calendar year zero if you're counting exactly. AD 26 is the year which many historians, including the ancient church historian Bishop Eusebius, give as the date of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, which marks the official beginning of Christ's public ministry. So you see how the Jews were counting, they were expecting something to happen about the time of Christ that he did appear. Next, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Jesus is the anointed one who is cut off, rejected by the authorities and put to death. His kingdom is not of this world. He has no legions, no earthly property to will to his followers. Next, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Forty years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jerusalem revolted against the Roman Empire. General Titus Flavius Vespons Vespasianus A.D. 39 to 81, he lived, was dispatched with three Roman legions, that's about 15,000 soldiers, to subdue the city of Jerusalem. Titus was not yet a prince, but he was a prince to come, because after his great victory over Jerusalem, he became the emperor of Rome, Caesar, in A.D. 79. Verse 30, 20, 26, right now, reapplied now to the Antichrist, the son of perdition. After the 62 weeks, so where are we? Counting from 1531, Mary's call at Guadalupe, plus 49 years of seven weeks, plus 430 years, four, four years of 62 weeks, we'd be about the year A.D. 2014. Or if you count from Pope, Pope's call at Rome, in, from 1534, plus 49 years, plus 434 years, you'd be about the year A.D. 2017. Next, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. An anointed one is cut off around 2014 to 2017. Pope Benedict XVI, Vicar of Jesus Christ, resigned on February 28, 2013. Benedict's power to rule is cut off for reasons not fully disclosed. They're still arguing about exactly what motivated the Pope to resign and if he freely did so, etc. So moving on, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Bergoglio, his successor, whose legitimacy is still obscure, immediately begins to cut off some of the papal property. In a show of poverty and simplicity, he renounces the papal quarters in the Vatican, the special vehicles, etc. But then he begins to undermine the papacy itself. Who am I to judge? a priority of environmentalism over spiritual matters, eschewing of papal authority by urging synods and even individuals to make their own decisions. The highly respected and amazingly accurate prophecy of St. Malachi, Archbishop of Armagh, Ireland in the 1100s, suggests that the papacy will be interrupted for a time. 
It could appear as if the apostolic succession had ended. The description of the 111th Pope as the glory of the olive aptly fits Pope, aptly fits Pope Benedict. Prior to the 2005 papal conclave, this motto, the glory of the olive, led to speculation that the next pontiff would be from the order of St. Benedict, whose symbols include the olive branch. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was not a Benedictine, but he chose the name Benedict, Benedict because of his fondness for Pope Benedict XV. Germany is also known as Benedict Land because of its many Benedictine abbeys. Also, in an olive branch, two leaves face each other, and in Benedict's reign led to the anomaly of two popes living in Rome. Furthermore, Dr. Taylor Marshall points out that the word Gethsemane in Hebrew means olive oil press. The agony of the garden was a prelude to the passion of Christ, and, the ben and Benedict's papacy may be compared to an agony in which many have fallen asleep. Benedict, says Dr. Taylor, is spending his last years in prayer and may be asking that the chalice of God's wrath might be taken from the church. Only one pope remains on Malachi's list, but the epithet doesn't begin in the typical manner. It simply begins in persecutions extrema, which forms a separate sentence and paragraph of its own, allowing for an interruption, perhaps a long interval, or even a long era of additional popes between the glory of the olive and Peter the Roman. We'll return to Malachi in a moment. Let us turn to our attention now to St. John Bosco's famous dream of the church in a naval battle. This vision is quite well known and deserves credibility. The saint shared it often in the 1800s to urge people to be prepared for a time of suffering ahead. A careful reading implies that the papacy will be cut off for a time, as Daniel foresaw. I'm quoting now from um, the, the Long Dream, which is probably, hopefully, familiar to everyone. Somehow, the Pope was hit seriously and fell down. Those around him went to his rescue and lifted him. This historical position of this incident within the dream easily refers to the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Square, May 13, 1981. The paramedics, the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima, and the prayers of the Church lifted him. And then, it says, the Pope was hit the second time. He fell down again and expired. But this is a different Pope, not John Paul II. Now, previously in the dream, Don Bosco said that the Pope convened his pilots, but winds, that's at the times, broke it up. The other details make this incident a clear reference to Pope Pius IX and the convening of Vatican I. The dream immediately continues, the situation having improved a little, the Pope assembled the pilots around him for the second time. The second time doesn't refer to an action of the same Pope, because this is a clear reference to Vatican II, which occurred a century later. St. John Bosco first narrated this dream on May, May 30, 1862, so the dream prophesied both councils and an interval between them. In the night vision, the saint probably only saw indistinctly a man dressed in white whom he recognized as a pope. Therefore, any number of years could intervene between St. Paul II, St. John Paul St. John Paul II, who fell and was lifted, and the second fall and expiration of a subsequent pope. Moreover, the word fall might refer not so much as a personal attack, but an attack on the concept of the papacy itself. And then another line from this dream, a shout of victory and jubilation arose from the enemies. There was rejoicing in their ships, but immediately after the death of the pontiff, another pope was installed in his place. The assembled pilots had elected him so quickly that the notice of the death of the pope arrived with the notice of the election of his successor. How, in this modern world of instant communication, could a conclave be held before the news of the death of a pope become known? Four possibilities. One, a pontiff could be driven from Rome then die in exile without public knowledge because of a suppressed or controlled media. Cardinals could hold a secret conclave to elect a successor who might reign in secret for a period of time before he can be openly proclaimed as Pope, 
at which time the public would learn of the death of his predecessor. A second scenario would be a pontiff could be illicitly elected, but he reigns openly because the general public and perhaps many prelates are unaware of the circumstances that actually invalidated his election. Therefore, for a period of time, the papacy has expired, but this is not public knowledge. Eventually, a certain number of prelates and cardinals would assemble privately to review the situation and pronounce the papacy null and void. They would proceed immediately to elect the next pontiff, in which case the announcement of the new pontiff would coincide with the announcement of the, quote, death of the pretended papacy, regardless if the former occupier of the chair of Peter might still be living. Third scenario. A pontiff himself, licitly or illicitly elected, could undermine the concept of the papacy, fall into heresy, and lead many of the flock into heresy. He is now an apostate, no longer a Catholic, and therefore his pontificate, legitimate or illegitimate, has expired, even though he continues to reign until a certain number of prelates and cardinals would assemble privately to review the situation and pronounce the papacy null and void. They would proceed to elect the next pontiff, in which case the announcement of the new pontiff would coincide with the announcement of the, quote, death of the heretic pope, regardless if the former occupier of the chair of Peter might still be living. And then there is the fourth scenario. The apostate pope, just mentioned at number three, could announce the end of the papacy as an antiquated institution. Notice that the prince who is to come is not called an anointed. A cardinal is a prince of the church, but he might come to the papacy without the legitimate anointing. Also, prince is a biblical title for a variety of government offices, which might assume the government of the church in place of the papacy, as we see in patriotic churches in communist countries. Malachi suggests that the next pope, secretly elected, would face extreme persecution. I'll try the Latin. In persecutione extrema Romane ecclesiae sedibit Petrus Romanus, qui pascet ovis in multis tribulationis, quibus transactis civitas septis colis derietur et judex tremendus, judicabit populum sum, amen. Or in English, in extreme persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there shall reign Peter the Roman, who will feed his flock amid many tribulations, after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed, and the terrible judge will judge the people. Peter the Roman will be a good pope, because he will feed his flock. His name might not be Peter, but he will be a legitimate successor of the apostle, and a true vicar of Christ. He will defend Roman Catholicism. The seven-hilled city would not be Rome, which this pope is defending, but the city of Babylon, shown in the Apocalypse as a harlot city who sits upon the seven-horned beasts. God will send a chastisement to destroy the enemies of the church. Jesus, the anointed one, was cut off, rejected by the authorities of his day, and put to death. To cut off Christ's vicar, the successor of Peter, has been the goal of Protestantism from the beginning. The common denominator of the currently estimated 40,000 Protestant denominations is that they are Protestants, protesters of the papacy. Martin Luther declared, if I succeed in doing away with the mass, then I shall have completely conquered the Pope. The ideals of Protestantism became subsequently reflected in Freemasonry's liberty, equality, and tolerance. Then communism sprang from Freemasonry. In 1845, Karl Marx became a member of the Masonic Lodge, Le Socialiste. Three years later, Marx published his Communist Manifesto under the orders of the Masonic leadership. Engels was a Freemason. Several sources reveal that Lenin became a Freemason whilst abroad in 1908. Lenin's comrades, Alexander Kerensky, Trotsky, and Engels were all Freemasons. Lenin's objective was to overthrow all monarchies, all royalty. The apostolic succession from Christ to Peter and onwards would be a thorn to all ideologies which deny the divine authority of a human representative. The Blessed Mother has identified the red dragon of the apocalypse with communism and the two beasts with Freemasonry. I've discussed this in detail in the series The Unveiling of the Apocalypse. It's not my purpose in this particular conference to show the multitude of corollaries between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. 
Here we are looking specifically at Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, which focuses on the anointed one as it applies both to Christ and again to Antichrist. At Fatima, Our Lady told the children, the Holy Father will have much to suffer. And in the third secret, the bishop in white makes his way through a city in ruins to a large cross. Quote, having reached the top of the mountain, he is killed by a group of soldiers who fire bullets and arrows at him. We can interpret the arrows as similar to the books in Don Bosco's dream. Quote, all the enemy ships made a rush to attack the, her and went all out to capture and sink her, some with writings, books, and incendiary materials with which they were fully aimed, which they were fully armed, were trying to slant her, others with their cannons, guns, and beaks. Killing a pope with bullets wouldn't stop the apostolic succession. Cardinals would elect a new pontiff, even if it was politically unsafe for him to act in public. But killing the papacy with pointed ideas to slant political thinking is more le lethal. What would happen to the Catholic Church if its own leaders decided that the papacy was an outdated mode of government and instead they set up the bishops in a sort of democratic parliament or gave all the baptized citizens equal, votes, equal right to vote? Bishops could validly consecrate priests and bishops. The sacraments need not cease. But no decision would thenceforth carry divine authority. Christ did not make the 12 his representative, but only one. No matter how many votes, even if unanimous, could assure the faithful that a decision or pronouncement of whatever kind would have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit's protection. Like all the Protestant and Orthodox churches, the body would only soon divide into factions, for a house divided cannot stand. This situation could last only for a limited time, Because Jesus promised, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. So how long might this death of the papacy last? When the passage, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, was applied to Jesus Christ, he reigned for about three years. Then he was rejected by the authorities and put to death. For nearly 40 years after Jesus' death, Caiaphas and his successors remained in public office as high priest and supreme pontiff. Peter reigned in secret. He was a hunted man, jailed repeatedly, and finally executed shortly before the temple sanctuary and much of the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the people of a prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, as Daniel prophesied. Will Rome literally be destroyed, or will communism infiltrate Roman Catholicism? Quote, uh, who am I quoting? Blessed Elena Aiello, Italian stigmatist and foundress of an orf order for war orphans, beatified in 2011 under Pope Benedict. She said this in 1959. Russia will march upon all the nations of Europe, particularly Italy, and will raise her flag over the dome of St. Peter's. Italy will be severely tried by a great revolution, and Rome will be purified in blood for its many sins, especially those of impurity. The flock is about to be dispersed, and the Pope must suffer greatly. And later she says in 1961, Rome will not be saved, because the Italian rulers have forsaken the divine light, and because only a few people really love the church. But the day is not far off when all the wicked shall perish under the tremendous blows of divine justice. And then Our Lady had said at La Salette, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. So now the last verse. Verse 27, applied first to Christ, the son of Mary. Its end shall come, like a come with a flood. In scripture, a flood can be an expression for many types of sudden distress. Um, Psalm 90, you have swept them away like a flood. They fell asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. Wrath is fierce and anger is a flood, said Proverbs. The siege of Jerusalem went on for several years, but when the walls were finally breached, there was a sudden chaos as thousands of Roman soldiers poured into the city like a torrent of destruction. To the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. The execution and sacrificial death of Jesus the Messiah 
decreed an end of the old rites of the culture of the old city. The Jews could not resign themselves to being an occupied nation. There were many restless uprisings before, during, and after the time of Jesus. Barabbas himself was an insurrectionist. And next, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. This verse has a compressed double fulfillment. One, the he can refer back to the anointed one of verse 25. Jesus the Messiah had announced the beginning of his ministry as a seven-year sabbatical year. During his ministry, Jesus makes a strong covenant, a new covenant. And two, the he can also apply to the prince of the people who is to come. About the year 62 AD, Jew Jewish Sicarii, that is dagger men, massacred the Roman garrison in Jerusalem. The 12th legion was sent to suppress the zealots, but the dagger men defeated the Romans with 5,000 casualties and the loss of its Roman eagle. This meant war to the death between Rome and the Jews. Hence, this was a strong decision of the Romans that lasted from 62 to 63 until Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. The he in this verse would refer specifically to the son of Vespasianus, also named Titus, who took over the commission when his father was called to Rome at the death of Nero in AD 68. In the next section, and in the midst of the week. The week of the Messiah is divided. The 70th week is the week of the Messiah. The seven years are, of this week are divided and enclose a generation of about 40 years. In the first half of the week, circa AD 27 to 33, somewhere in there, Jesus' ministry on earth comprised about three years and four months from Jesus' baptism to his crucifixion when the temple veil was rent in two. And then the midst of the week was AD 30 to 40, 70. After Jesus' death, there was a 40-year interval of mercy. The apostles remained a long time in Jerusalem, preaching and worshiping in the temple. The Jews had time to reflect on the Messiah. Many had expected a political Messiah and did not recognize Jesus' true identity. But after considering his life and listening to the apostles, large numbers of Jews were baptized, including many priests, even Rabbi Gamaliel, according to some traditions. However, other Jews hardened in their opposition to Jesus. This period was interspersed with erratic persecutions in synagogues in Israel and beyond. Stephen was killed. Paul was stoned and expelled from various cities. Toward the end of this interval of 40 years, a fearsome persecution broke out through the emperor Nero. It was a time for all Jews to decide for or against Jesus as the true Messiah. And then the conclusion of this week, the destruction of the temple, which went on from 67 to 70 AD. The accusation most cited in Jesus' trial concerned his identification of his physical body with the temple. When Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, he was interrogated. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he spoke of the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Next section, and then the next verse. He shall, the next phrase in this verse, he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. The temple sacrifices definitively ended with the destruction of the temple, but they had begun to fail at 40, 40 years earlier when the curtain was torn at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Moreover, a passage in the Talmud, the Rosh Hashanah, um, section 3, relates a rabbinic tradition in which a scarlet thread would turn white on Yom Kippur if the atoning ritual sacrifice was accepted. During the 40 years preceding the fall of the temple, the scarlet re thread remained scarlet. It did not turn white. And then, upon the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. English translations of Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks are generally in close agreement. 
but there is some uncertainty regarding the expression concerning the wing. Does it refer to an architectural st section of the temple, or does it refer spiritually and metaphorically to an overspreading of abominations? Both aspects applied in the first century. The Jewish historian Josephus was personally present during the siege at Jerusalem, and he left a detailed account of the rebellion of certain Jews who claimed allegiance to political messianic figures. In the year AD 66, the Jews successfully expelled the Romans from Jerusalem. In response, the Emperor Nero dispatched an army under the generalship of Vespasian to try to restore order. Meanwhile, Nero committed suicide and Vespasian went to Rome to be crowned emperor. Vespasian sent his son Titus to continue the siege. Amidst the turmoil, the vast store of provisions for the temple sacrifices was burned. The sacrifices ceased and starvation ensued. On August 10, AD 70, the uncircumcised Romans raised the city and burned down the temple. No Jew was allowed to live in the city except those in the service of the 10th legion. The abominations is in the plural. The destructive presence of the Roman pagans within the sanctuary was an abomination. The rituals in the temple had become an abomination because the true sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was the true and the true Messiah had been rejected. And then there was the blood of the slain which defiled the temple, another abomination. Proverbs 15, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 28, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Proverbs 3, the perverse man is an abomination to the Lord. The desolator is in the singular. A single desolator could be the body of rebellious Jews who were responsible for rousing the wrath of the Romans. And a single desolator could have been the person of Titus. Titus, like Pilate, tried to wash his hands of responsibility, saying that he did not order the fire to be started, which destroyed the temple, because he, Titus, had hoped to convert the temple of Yahweh to a temple honoring a Roman god. That was an abomination that Yahweh did not allow. So now, this final verse applied to the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Its end shall come with a flood. Revelation 12, and the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. Who is the apocalyptic woman at war with the serpent? A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. The woman clothed with the sun is different from the bride of the lamb, the new holy city mentioned later in the same book of Revelation. The woman clothed with the sun appeared at Guadalupe. I am the ever virgin Mary, mother of the true God. Mary spoke in the Indian language and the combination of words which used must have sounded like de Guadalupe to the Spaniards. The Aztec te Guadalupe has a similar sound pronounced somehow, te qualuspe. Te means stone, qua means serpent, tla can be interpreted as the, while zupe means serpent. The feathered serpent god, Quetzalcoatl, was one of several Aztec gods to whom the Indians annually offered over, over 20,000 men, women, and children in bloody sacrifice. However, by calling herself the entirely perfect Virgin Mary, we think of another serpent, the one in Eden. Pope Pius IX declared in his encyclical Adiem Illum that the woman in Revelation 12, quote, signified the Virgin Mary, who remained inviolate when she brought forth our head. So John the Apostle saw the most holy mother of God already enjoying happiness, yet travailing in a kind of mysterious childbirth. What birth was this? Clearly it was the birth of us who are still de detained in exile and yet to be generated in the perfect charity of God and to eternal happiness. And the labors in the childbirth show the desire and love with which the Virgin on her throne watches over us and strives with unceasing prayer to complete the number of the elect." End quote. General apostasy of the whole church would mean the end of forgiveness. Hebrews 10 
If we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire. And a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. A man who has violated the law of Moses dies without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the man who has spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and, outra and outraged the spirit of grace? At Hebrews 10. But God had a backup plan. Mary, the new Eve, will have unique authority to intercede and to save. Our Lady of Fatima, July 13, 1917. I want you to come here on the 13th of next month to continue to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and an end of the war. Then switching to the third person, because only she can help you. Our Lady of Amsterdam, May 10th, 1953. Through this prayer, the Lady will save the world. Our Lady of Akita, October 13, 1973. I alone am able still to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. And quoting Daniel, to the end there shall be war, desolations are decreed. Chaos, confusion, division will rise among the people of God to prove what is genuine, says Corinthians 1. When you assemble as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. And Our Lady of Akita, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against other bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. And quoting Daniel, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. This verse has a compressed double fulfillment. One, the he can refer back to the anointed one of verse 25, that is, the papacy. The new pope may be elected in secret and make a firm commitment with a remnant of faithful Christians to hold fast, even until death. Or two, the he could also refer to the anointed one of verse 27, the Antichrist. St. Paul affirms that the son of perdition is restrained by some power. In order for the Antichrist to come to power, he must make a firm decision, a strong covenant with Satan, to remove the restrainer. Second Thess Thessalonians, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. What is the restrainer? the Holy Mass, which draws down the protective presence of Jesus, the High Priest. Quoting um, Hart Hartman Greaser is quoting Martin, Martin Luther here. On the Mass, as on a rock, the whole of the papacy is based with its monasteries, bishoprics, colleges, altars, services, and doctrines. If the sacrilegious and cursed custom of the Mass is overthrown, then the whole must fall. Daniel, and in the midst of the week. The week of the anti-Messiah is divided. The 70th week is the week of the Messiah. The seven years are divided and enclosed a generation of about 40 years. In the first half of the week, around 2014, or maybe it won't start till 2020 because things are delayed by the prayers of the faithful, this indicates an interruption of events as happened in the first fulfillment of this prophecy with the death of Jesus and the subsequent destruction of Jerusalem. This division of seven is hinted at by Daniel who gives two different numbers for three and a half years. Quoting Daniel 12, and now from that moment that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the horrible abomination is set up, 
there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits with patience and attains 1,335 days. And then, quoting Sister Bridge McKenna in her work, Miracles Do Happen, a time is coming when there will be a great famine. There will be hunger for the bread of life. Little by little, Jesus told her, the priesthood will die. So the Mass will not be publicly celebrated for about 1,290 days of this first half of the week. And then the Blessed Mother speaks of the abolition of the Mass in the Merry Movement of Priests. I'll just quote four, um, four passages very briefly. Number 485, One day you will see in the holy place he who commits the horrible sacrilege. The prophet Daniel spoke of this. Let the reader seek to understand. 485, now from the moment that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the horrible abomination is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits with patience and attains 1,335 days. And the same paragraph goes, goes on. The Holy Mass is the daily sacrifice, she says. The pure oblation, which is offered to the Lord everywhere, from the rising of the sun to its going down. The holy sacrifice of the Mass renews that which was accomplished by Jesus on Calvary. By accepting the Protestant doctrine, people will hold that the Mass is not a sacrifice, but only a sacred meal, that is to say, a remembrance of that which Jesus did at his Last Supper. And thus the celebration of Holy Mass will be suppressed. In this abolition of the daily sacrifice consists the horrible sacrilege, the horrible sacrilege accomplished by the Antichrist, which will last about three and a half years, namely 1,290 days. And then Daniel, in the midst of the week, I would say maybe around 2014 to 2054, this time could be short shortened, Jesus says, for the sake of the elect. Sometime after the three and a half years of tribulation, during the reign of the Antichrist, there would be a long interval, about 40 years, in which people have a chance to reflect on the extreme evil and to make a choice for or against God. And then the conclusion of the week would be around 2053 to 2054, according to Our Lady of Amsterdam. In her 46th message, she said on May 10, 1953, 53 is the year of the Lady of All Nations. 53 is the year in which she, under this title, has to be made known among the nations. 53 is the year in which the great world events and world catastrophes will happen and threaten. This is why the lady asks you to pray this prayer and spread it out as much as possible. And then her 47th message, October 11th, 1953, the year 53, that is the year in which the Lady of All Nations must be brought into the world. For a long time, the Lady remained silent, um, after this, um, Ida said. And then she said, the Lady of All Nations will be allowed to bring peace to the world, yet she must be asked for it under this title. The Lady of All Nations will assist the Church of Rome. The Church of Rome, the community, shall invoke Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, under this new title, the Lady of All Nations. They shall pray my prayer against degeneration, disaster, and war, and bring it among all nations. I shall help the Church of Rome, the community. The nation shall invoke me under this title. Then the great work begins, the crowning of Mary, the proclamation of the dogma of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. First, however, let the church and the nations invoke Mary under her new title and pray her prayer so that degeneration, disaster, and war may be staved off from this world. If they do so, the nations of Europe will breathe a sigh of relief after the year 54. Now, the fifth day brings in the three days of darkness, with the fifth dogma, I've got the misspelling. With the fifth dogma, Mary will be able to act as the new Eve. With her son, Christ the new Adam, they will be able to expel all the demons from the face of the earth. As in the days of Exodus, there will be a plague of darkness, followed by the execution of the sons of Satan and many men and women who love evil. The just are to remain in their houses, 
not behind doorposts marked with the blood of lambs, but with their lips touched with the Eucharistic blood of the Lamb of God. The three days of darkness prophecy is well known, so we won't spend time on it here. Daniel continues, he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. All worship to Satan will definitively cease. False worship is an abomination to the Lord. Babylon is the unholy city, a cosmic entity, not a geographical place. Everyone in the world, including Christians, who accept its corruption becomes detestable. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations, Revelation 17. Now I'll quote from Ezekiel chapter 8. Go in and see the vile abominations that they are committing here. So, says Ezekiel, I went in and saw, and there portrayed upon the wall round about were all kinds of creeping things, and loathsome beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, with Joazniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, every man in his room of pictures? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord said to me also, You will see still greater abominations which they commit. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, the temple. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? You will see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the temple of the Lord. And behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men, with their backs to the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. Quoting Daniel, And upon the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Revelations 18, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she, Babylon the Great, will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. And quoting Our Lady's words at Akita, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will never have seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. In Hebrews chapter 9, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. The Savior returns in mystery, in a cloud of worshipers, the saints, Hebrews 12, who acknowledge him as Lord. Mark 14, Jesus said, I am with you, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Revelation 21, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Amen.